Coming up later on Radio Flange Goblet, it's how many pineapples does it take? A new reality TV show where they see how many pineapples it will take to sink a submarine in the time that it takes celebrity chef Gerald Kinkjammer to boil his ex-wife's remains, add mayonnaise and toss a salad. Plus, the music of Latvian clog duo Ernst and Bertolf Calamity with their rendition of Oh, it's all right, Ma. I'm only selling off my future now to buy a really nice purple felt hat I've had my eye on. I'm being told now by the producer of the show the original title makes a lot more sense in Latvian. But now it's the after-movie diner, which this week comes all the way from the Wafty Pants, a half-Dutch, half-Ethiopian restaurant on the edge of the Gobi Desert, where the wine is racy, the chat is tedious, and quite a lot of the waiting staff wear nothing but trousers with the buttocks cut out, due to a spate of bad pranks pulled by the chef, who can only make one dish and uses way, way, way too much butter and tufts of his own body hair. You're listening to the After Movie Diner with your host, John Cross. That's right, I am John Cross, and some of my body has never felt the warm kiss of sunlight on it. Hello, Jason Statham fans, Jason Statham hams, Jason Statham's glands, Glenda Jackson's outrageous tans, Menachem Begin's flans, the Mormon Tabernacle's also rans, Akira Kurosawa's pots and pans, Leonard Rossiter's other man, and half a pinch of cumin. Welcome one, and welcome all. Now, normally, this is the part of the introduction where I go off and talk all about the way you can support the diner. Uh, And it would be really great if you supported the diner, because especially, by the way, the Squarespace renewal price is coming up, and I have to pay for another year of the website. Well, that's quite costly, and blah, 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 blah. Anyway... Uh, there's a reason why I'm not going through the usual spiel right now, is that we have a different spiel, because we got a new supporter on the Patreon page, and there's a little bit of a story behind it. Now, while I've been doing the uh, uh, Sleazy Spader Springtime shows, uh, which have been uh, a huge amount of fun, I've also still been going out to the cinema every week with the regular co-host Jim and recording other shows which we'll play later but aren't time-sensitive, like the Spade of Springtime thing. And uh, the beginning of one of those recent recordings in a diner, uh, Jim and myself were talking about supporting the show and Patreon and various other things. And it's so funny that that's what we're discussing uh, because of what happened next, which I will tell you once you've heard this clip. The reason why I'm playing this clip now is uh, uh, later in the year when this particular episode uh, airs, it won't have any relevance anymore, this conversation about Patreon at the beginning. Uh, So it's worth playing now because of what happened next. So take a listen. One last bit of business. Right. So I want to use this time uh, before we talk the film every week to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon. That's wonderful, glorious people, one and all. One and all. Uh, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash after movie diner. A big thank you uh, to all the people who support us on Patreon. Can I just just send out a message to the people who don't support you on Patreon? You're freeloading, blood-sucking scum. Good. Um, <laughs> that's they, they've now turned off a second time. They tuned back in and went. Maybe they've stopped. It's talking. like a dollar for yeah. for an episode. <laughs> What's wrong with you? So anyway, thank you so much for all those who support on Patreon. Don't forget to check out our Patreon page at patreon. Which is amazing. Forward slash after movie. Got so much stuff on there. You got uh, one dollar. You get your name shouted out or a thank you on the thing. Three dollars. You get a song written about you, and I'll say any advert you want for your thing. Five dollars, I think you get a mug and a, a video and a bunch of other stuff. There's loads of rewards. But what I've started doing as well is you'll also get the episodes a few days early. So that is so that is an unbelievable deal. Yeah, because you know when it's like two days before the diner's supposed to come out and you're on a commute or whatever, yeah. and you think, you know what I could really use right now? Yeah. Is a couple of bellends talking about things they don't know anything about. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's what I need. Yeah. That's what's going to make this hellish journey yeah. to or from hell. Yeah. My bit, you know, a bit more a easy A couple of hellish novels. And all it would cost me is a dolly, you freeloading <laughs> fucking bastard. <laughs> 
And and Jim has decided because no, but like he's really nice all the time. Right? He's like, hey, you know, maybe you fancy signing up for Patreon. That'd be nice. None of you do. So I'm trying a different tactic, which is talking to you directly. That's you, a, that's who's listening, and we know more Some people, people listen. Oh, we know more people listen than than pledge on Patreon, which not means anymore. I'm talking to you, you freeloading bastard. Um, Owen did recently buy all my albums, which was very cool. Good work, Owen. Uh, and you, you're not. You're all right. Uh, Matt Farley uh, uh, did another thing which you can do on the website, which is called Buy Me a Coffee, which is literally you press a button and it donates $3 to the diner. It's just a one-time donation, but it's like... Good work, Farley. It's called Buy Me a Coffee. Good work, Farley. Um, Farley, and, the opposite of freeloading. Yeah, and um, I think Charlie also did that. Um, also the opposite. And uh, and many people are shopping through Amazon now through the website, which is uh, now that does get you off the freeloading bastard list if it you does. do that because it it, I mean it's pennies. It does. But at least it's something. It is. Uh, so there we go. So there. there I don't think I'm not still angry with all upset. the rest of it. Yeah. All I'm saying is there are many, 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 many ways to support the show to get off my uh, shit list, and and uh, you probably probably should do because Jim seems to be very <laughs> angry at this point. So that conversation happened, and nobody had heard it before. Uh, that's literally the first time it's been broadcast. But the very next day, as if some sort of mystical force flew through the universe from a diner to this uh, a wonderful person who I'm about to read their email. This dropped into my Gmail inbox. I tried to buy a T-shirt, but for some reason the only option seems to be small. I need a large. Funny thing is that I ended up going through the Patreon tier with the T-shirt instead. It's more money eventually, but I figure I've thoroughly enjoyed 40-plus episodes of your show without giving you one thin dime. After reading your Ash vs. Evil Dead goodbye post, I felt compelled to put up or shut up. I need for the after-movie diner to exist for a long time. How else am I going to find out all about those obscure B-movie gems? But I like your mainstream movie critiques and your crazy voice and ukulele songs as well. Just keep them coming, okay? So, obviously, I reached out to Mika Johnson, who was the person who wrote that awesome message, to find out more. Firstly, let me just say thank you for your generous support of the After Movie Diner and the kind words in your email. Sometimes you are putting podcasts, articles and albums out into the world and you think maybe only a handful of your friends and your mum really care. So good to find out that's not the case. How did you find Ask the Show the site, by the way? As for the t-shirt, please send me the link to the design you're looking for and I'll see if I can get the right size. So uh, I reached out to, to Mika and Mika responded. I'm pretty sure it was during the run-up to Ash vs. Evil Dead coming to stars. I started following Dana DiLorenzo on Twitter, and she linked to your interview with her. You did such a great job with the interview, and then I went into the backlog of the podcast, discovering how truly deep your Evil Dead and Bruce Campbell obsession went. By the time I listened to all the Evil Dead content, I'd been exposed to your mad comedic and musical stylings, so I had to keep going. I listened to episodes that interested me, zombies, ninjas, superheroes, Terry Gilliam. Then I learned about trances 1 and 4 in particular. Particular, John Dies at the End, Marantau, and absolutely amazing movies that I had zero idea about. I started keeping a checklist and doing my homework before listening. It's always rewarding to watch a film and then hear you and your cadre of contributors go over it. I truly appreciated seeing more of Ash's adventures in Ash vs. Evil Dead, and the addition of Kelly and Pablo was such a great surprise. I didn't expect to get so invested in the newbies, and there were so many inventive bits. Kelly and the puppet, the more cadaver, yikes. I hadn't really looked at the written content on your site and today I came across your final Ash vs. Evil Dead post. It was so right on, I did subscribe to Stars so I can pat myself on the back, but it got me to thinking that if you want to keep something going, you have to support it with cold hard cash. So here I am. Anyway, what is awesome about that is not just that Mika Johnson went to Patreon and and, uh, uh, supported the show, which is obviously phenomenal. But what's awesome about that is that Mika's experience is exactly the experience I've always hoped someone would have, right? So we do a lot of stuff on the After Movie Diner website. We we throw stuff out into the atmosphere. We have these awesome contributors who write reviews. I sometimes come up with mad articles that I want to write about the 90s or about movies with the word massacre in the title or whatever it is, and I just spend ages putting those up. You know, we do these weird sleazy spade of springtime series or, you know, we cover Ash vs. Evil Dead. We do celebrity interviews. We do a whole bunch of stuff. 
And what I loved about what Mika uh, did was uh, they came in through an interview, which is always awesome because you hope that the uh, celebrity you're interviewing will be as great as Dana is, and Dana's really supportive of the show and retweets and tweets a lot of stuff. So that was awesome. But then... Instead of just going, okay, well, that was a good interview, thank you very much, and then going about their day, uh, Mika then delved more into both the podcast and then the site, and then not only that, but within the content, uh, one of which was the um, Ash vs. Evil Dead sort of final roundup, in which I chastised fans in that article for essentially uh, going, please let it continue on Netflix and or please let it continue somewhere else and please don't uh, give up on it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, when so many fans did not support the show by subscribing to Stars and so many fans did not support the show by, uh, you know, tweeting about it or spreading the word or giving putting their whole cold hard cash where it counted in order to keep the show going. Um, and and it always frustrates me with fandom when that happens. And what's awesome about that is that that particular article sort of made some penny drop in Mika's head and go, well, hang on a second, here's something I really like, which is the After Movie Diner, and I'm not giving any money towards that either. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and support it on Patreon. So I, I absolutely like... That, to, to me, this is like one of the best emails I've ever received doing the the show for this many years. Is is that it's just it's all tied in. Like Mika is getting all the movies they not heard about, um, you know, through uh, the show and 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 hearing about stuff that they don't know about and going out and making lists and reading stuff and listening to stuff and getting into different movies. And I mean, that's awesome. That's all you hope. Like when you put a little thing out into the world, all you hope is that it inspires someone else to go and uh, uh, watch that film or listen to that music. But on top of that, to get someone who then uh, reads something you're saying about another show, Ash vs. Evil Dead, which was sadly cancelled uh, due to uh, lack of viewership and, and, and lack of support on the Stars app, uh, uh, and have that inspire someone to support you. Well, to me, that's, that's phenomenal. I can't thank uh, Mika Johnson enough for... Uh, writing uh, to us and also supporting the show and uh, you will definitely be getting a t-shirt and a song and lots of other stuff uh, winging its way to you uh, very soon when time permits but thanks ever so much Mika and uh, I hope you enjoy uh, this new episode the last of 2018's Sleazy Spade of Springtime 3 Tis the sleazy. Oh, it's sleazy spider springtime. Welcome to the show. Oh, it's a sleazy spider springtime. I want you all to know that if you please, there's James Spader sleaze and it's got nowhere else to go. So loosen all your blouses, give your nose a damn good blow. It's sleazy spider springtime. Uh, now that net neutrality has been destroyed, uh, we you know might not even be able to upload podcasts in the future. Who knows? So no, oh, cassette tapes, man. Yeah, right? right. We'll just be passing them around each other. I just uh, rewatched Pump Up the Volume the other night just for for reference, you know, yeah, yeah, what yeah. we're going to have to start doing. Well, man, I, <laughs> I, I went on a, uh, a Christian Slater kick recently, and uh, we watched The Legend of Billie Jean, and I really wanted to follow it up with Pump Up the Volume. I couldn't find it anywhere unless I like bought it for fourteen ninety nine. I just couldn't find it like streaming anywhere, and that's why I'll never give up the physical media because there's those movies where you're like, oh, I'd really like to stream that or watch that tonight, and you just you can't find it anywhere. You know what I mean? Like you look on Vudu and iTunes and Netflix and Hulu and Amazon and all the places, and yeah. So uh, I got to get that back on DVD. I used to have it on VHS, but I haven't upgraded it yet. So I got to pick. Pick that up at some point um, and rewatch that because that's a damn good movie. And we should talk about it when we go into Tough Turf because it kind of fits into the whole teenage rebel uh, genre as well. Uh, hello and welcome to the After Movie Diner. And this week's episode is a particularly special episode. It's another recorded episode. It's another episode from Sleazy Spader Springtime 3 
Tis the season, uh, but it's also incredibly special because we've got some first-time guests on the show. Uh, they're all the way from the Poop Culture podcast, a uh, phenomenal show that everyone should be uh, subscribing to, downloading and listening to, and telling all their friends about. It is uh, the marvelous Rick Mancrush and Mark James. Gentlemen, uh, lovely to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us on, man. Yeah. And you, let, me, uh, let me preface everything by saying, you know, last minute, this past week, we needed a judge for our duel of the decades. And now your name is no longer John Cross. You're the honorable John Cross because you came on our show as the judge. And you did a phenomenal job. Uh, go and uh, catch that. We'll be out on Wednesday so you can see how John judged the duel of the decades, which was June of 1988 versus June of 1998. It was one for the record books. It's such a damn good idea, guys. I tell you, when I was on the show, I was thinking to myself, this should be... Uh, you know, a, a game show or or a, a TV show or like one of those judge shows or something on like a network. That, you know, because they're always trying to look for like new stuff, and actually, all they end up doing is recycling the same old crap. And it would be wonderful to have like a show because it would play into the nostalgia thing. It plays into people's interest into you know news of the time and music of the time and movies and all that stuff. Like it's got such a a nice big thing. Plus, you're looking at like the 90s versus the 80s. Plus, you've got the whole judge set up so you could like do it in a courtroom and thing. It feels like something that should have been like on MTV back in the day, like a half Holy hour. Holy shit. You know what you I mean? You just gave me an idea. This needs to be on YouTube. It really does. Yeah. It really does need to be on YouTube. Yeah. Fuck. We need, Thank you. Thank you. We need to find like a, a retro 90s or 80s host. That hasn't worked in you know two or three decades that we can bring back. Mark for... Summers. Yeah, well, no, he's <laughs> he's on Food Network, but like you know maybe I don't know. Like, what's Seth Green doing right now besides Robot Chicken? Is he doing much? He could host uh, it. I don't or... know. I I love doing that show though. It's you know every month we do a lot of different things on Poop Culture. You know we have our showdowns where we pick out any random topics and go through them. You know we bullshit. We have our poop news segments. We have interviews on there, but. Once a month, when we get to do this duel of decades, we get to tie in all the stuff that we liked as kids. And for Mark and I, we pretty much always do the 80s. One time we did the 90s, but it's so niche. And it's just having that one month in time. The research is fun. It doesn't feel like work at all. And you get to go back and just look at all the shit that maybe you remember from when you were a kid or stuff that you just went right over your head. That you're like, holy shit, that happened? You know, and uh, yeah. it's, it's really fun. So thank you for saying that. It's, uh, I'd love to have it on TV. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it's like occasionally I'll be uh, – I don't write so much for the website anymore. I have some great con- contributors. But the occasional things that I do write is when a conversation is taking place and someone will go – Ah, you know, I don't think the 90s were that great a decade or something like that. And I'm like, okay, I need to figure something out. So I will like go to Wikipedia or go to IMDb or go to all these places. And I did like recently an article on, you know, my personal top 10 from each year of the 90s and then kind of like boiled it down to a, a top 10 of the whole decade and then kind of broke apart some of the trends and things like that. And where I, I get into like little niche things like that all the time where I did a list of every movie that has Academy in the title and every movie that has Massacre in the title because they, they again, were like movie trends <laughs> where... You know, people started just throwing the word massacre or academy at the end of anything that was oh, either yeah. a yep. sex romp or a slasher, you know. So, um, you know, it's the little things like that. that And, and I feel like your uh, uh, Battle of the Decade uh, uh, show definitely kind of reawakens that. But then adds, you know, news and pop culture and all this other stuff to it, which is great as well. Sorry, oh, Mark. it's it's so much fun. And, you know, you threw out Wikipedia in there. One of the things that we agree on when we do this we are not allowed to use Wikipedia at all for our research. Uh, it's kind of like a gentleman's agreement. I think for the most part, everyone's kind of stuck to that. Uh, we go into the show not knowing anything about, you know, what our opponents have. You know, we yeah. all come in blind. Even the judge comes in blind. Uh, a little plug here to newspapers.com because that's the only thing I use for research. And I will cover the entire month in newspapers. And honestly, that's the only way to get a real honest assessment of these months. So don't go to Wikipedia, people. Like, spend a couple, mu- spend a couple bucks on newspapers.com. It's worth it. 
if you're into nostalgia, you'll find all kinds of shit. Even the ads are really fun to yeah, look at. That's the best part of it is you're also supporting local journalism. I mean, this is the real quality things. When you want real opinions, like on when a movie came out, you know, when First Blood comes out in the theater for the very first time, you want an initial reaction. What was it like the first time somebody saw this? Now it's different because they've seen, you know, all the other Rambo things and it's a different perspective for the first time. And you get that with some of these newspapers. So you totally. don't get and, that with Wikipedia. And ha- it's, it's such a great thing that you just said, too, because now if you look at it in today's day and age, you know, a new movie comes out. There's thousands of podcasts that are covering that movie. So exactly. it's really simple to, to get any Tom Dick or Harry's input on whatever movie you came out back then. All you had to rely on were these newspapers, and you had like the big, like you know, the uh, the Eberts and everybody else giving you your your movie reviews, or some local guy, you know, that might like. I think one month we did, uh, I think it was Breakfast Club was one of our movies, yeah. And I remember coming across an article where they slammed it and said it was just a bunch of like obnoxious teenagers, and it was going to be a terrible movie, and blah. And look at it now, yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, no, we we I used to collect uh, Empire Magazine back in the day. That was my thing uh, before the internet, and then also before Empire just became a shill for the studios, essentially. Um, and it was always fun to be able to go, hang on a second, you know, especially when like sequels and 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 uh, remakes and stuff started coming out. Being able to kind of go back to see what the writers in Empire thought when the first one came out or when the the sequel was mooted or whatever it was, and then, like, you look it up later on, you go, well, wait a minute, that's a huge disconnect, or maybe they were right, or whatever it is. Like, it's always fun to kind of do that research back and forth. Right. And in terms of oh, sort yeah. of the, <clears throat> the sort of podcasting movie space, it's one of the reasons why it, it's sort of endlessly interesting to me that... Um, Every single podcast at some point, a movie podcast rather, will kind of do a lot of new films because, I mean, I get it. You like the hosts, so therefore you want to listen to their opinions or, you know, you know, maybe maybe they're, they're friends of yours or whatever it is. But um, uh, ultimately, like, I'm only going to listen to maybe one, maybe two podcasts about the latest Marvel movie before moving on to something else. So what we've, although we have covered like brand new movies on the show what we always try and do is we have these seasons so we have like this the spader season and we've done uh other seasons we do our horatoba season and other stuff like that but also if we do go and see a new movie and uh cover it on the the diner with my regular co-host jim we try and go and see like we won't go see marvel the marvel stuff or we won't go right. see sort of the the couple we'll find like oh John Cusack has a movie out that's in the cinema for like one week in New York in some flea pit somewhere. Like, we'll go see that one. Like, when Cell came out, we were one of the only (laughs) three people to see Cell in a cinema in New York. And so we covered that. There was one that, you know, if um, there was one that came out that was called Anger of the Dead, I think, and it's awful, but it was uh, uh, a zombie film that was like made in. Uh, East Eastern Europe, like way past Bulgaria. (laughs) It was made like God knows where and dubbed into English and really awful and really bad and just bizarre acting and everything like that. And we went and saw that because it was out in the cinema for a week. We'll try and go. We we saw like Hurricane Heist, which was like the, the, you know, low budget uh, uh, B movie, but they're trying to give it like an A movie release and failing miserably. We'll, we'll go see those kind of movies rather than always going to see um, sort of a, a Marvel or a DC or a, well, you know, we do the odd one. We had to do Rampage because, you know, I've just got a thing for, you know, Dwayne The Rock Johnson beating up uh, flying wolves. But uh... <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the greatest video games ever. So Right, exactly. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. you, you got to go just because of the, the nostalgia factor just from that game alone. But it, we're very lucky living in New York that we actually get to go to the theater and see stuff like they played Hard Times, the Chuck Bronson movie, uh, um, Walter Hill's first film. And uh, they'll play, they, there's a Hammer Horror series going on at the Quad right now and little films like that. So we can still go to a movie theater. We can still then go to a diner afterwards and plunk the recorder down and start talking about it. But it's not going to necessarily be what everyone else is seeing. And I think that right. while... I don't know. While that might not put us on everyone's radar, it certainly makes the show a lot more interesting for me. <laughs> oh, oh, definitely. 
Definitely. You have to do something that you like. You know, you can't just, you know, if a new Marvel movie comes out, you just can't do an episode on the Marvel movie just because it's coming out. You got to, and Mark and I talk about this all the time. We try to only do things that interest us. Yeah. And, you know, I understand that, you know, ultimately you want people to listen to it and you want to make your audience happy with what you're putting out. And I think we do that, but at the same time, we only do it for things that are going to make us happy. You know, like right. even with our guests, we've had guests pitch to us that we're just like, eh, you know, it's, yeah, it's a big name or, you know, in this genre or that genre, but it, it, we're just not into it. And we've done it before. And we've said to us, you know, each other afterwards, we're like, nah, we're not doing that again. Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. I mean, if the, the person is a quote unquote bigger name, but it's just, if you're just not into it, it's, it's hard to get it in. It comes across. Right. It comes across totally. And I think it, it all goes back to what we were talking about just a few minutes ago. And that's, uh, you know, capturing those genuine emotions. Like when yeah. you're, we're talking about when you, you know, read a review of a, a movie for the first time. When in the podcasting world, we're kind of trying to do the same thing. Like when podcasts come out with a review of, you know, 47 new reviews this week of Black Panther. Okay, well, you're now listening to the same. That must have been a slow day. Yeah. <laughs> you're now listening to the exact same genuine reaction that you just had. Right. So you're not gaining anything there. Now, when you deal with retro content or more obscure movies, you're a, you're conveying a genuine response to somebody that hasn't had that yet. So there's value in that. So that's yeah. just kind of the angle I and come who, at it from. Who does a spader fucking see? That is <laughs> right. the coolest thing ever. Like, you know, we, we started talking about it a little bit on Twitter, you know, and I saw you post it and I was like, oh, hey, you know, that's funny. I just picked up a copy of Tough Turf. Yeah. And you're like, well, I just happen to be doing this whole season of James Spader. Who does? Nobody does that. Well, we and did. That's what makes your show great. It, 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 thank you, thank you so much. It came. We had, we had done a uh, Woods and Weller series, which was sort of the first long running series. It didn't go back to back. Spader always goes every year. We do four episodes on Spader back to back. It's like a, a thing. But the Woods and Weller was just this sort of informal series that went throughout the show. And every time my friend. John Wallace and I got together. We talked about a different Peter um, Peter Weller movie and a different James Woods movie, um, and then uh, we did. We tried to kind of do Kane and Keaton, so Michael Kane and Michael Keaton, uh, <laughs> and we did like a few episodes on that, but it didn't really run. And then uh, J John had a kid, so his life became uh, busier and different. And um, and then I forget how Spader came about, but there was we were sort of talking about his innate sleaziness, which is sort of the thing that's meant to kind of tie all these things together. Although we've certainly done movies in which he isn't sleazy at all. Um, and uh, we, at it as a joke, kind of went, well, let's see. And we watched a few Spader films and did the first series and we called it Sleazy Spader Springtime and that was it. And we thought that would be it. And then every year I've kind of resurrected it because I think he's got a really interesting... Uh, um, catalog of films uh, under his belt, and he he's sort of done a a bunch of different genres, and everyone has their own Spader experience. They have they have their own Spader memories oh, totally. when it comes to the movies that they've seen. You know, a lot of people I don't think are aware of just how many sci-fi films he's done. Like he's done a yep. bunch of sci-fi yep. stuff, and um, you know, and also the Tough Turf that we're going to be talking about on this episode. It's sort of a a big departure. For him, in terms of the Brat Pack stuff he did, um, yeah. I mean, it ties a little into sort of less than zero, I guess. But but uh, it's still what a happened to Spader? Like before we get into anything, sure, sure, sure. What hap What happened to Spader? Like you look at him in this movie. You know, this is the his first title role, and he was in this movie. He's he's a good looking dude, and now you see him in Blacklist. Do you ever think him in 1985? would see James Spader of 2018 and be like, holy fuck, what the hell did I do to myself? Because well, he looks terrible now. <laughs> I think what happened, and I, I'm going to go, I, I'm going to kind of go out on a limb, but I think what happened is that uh, he became friends with William Shatner and uh, whatever William Shatner does to sort of balloon to sort of max, because <laughs> Shatner's, Shatner's not fat. He sort of like, um, like a he's barrel, puffy. like his skin, like yeah. he's and and his skin is like 
uh, uh, tight and red and puffy and weird. <laughs> and I think he did. He did like five it's from seasons. Space. I love yeah. no yeah it's for, it's probably some space disease. Um, how I like to describe it is how William Shatner looks now. Is we all know the story that the uh, Michael Myers mask the was mask, really yeah. just William Shatner's face turned yes. inside out and then spray painted white. Well, yeah. William Shatner now looks like if you take a Michael Myers mask, invert <laughs> right. it and then spray it white. Or spray it, spray it like alcoholic red, like that right, red like, that you get when yeah. you've drunk too many whiskeys. Right, you give it a spray tan. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, what, so, but he did the five seasons of Boston Legal, and if you see him when he begins Boston Legal, and if you see when the season ends, the five seasons end of Boston Legal, um, I think that's what it is. And what's what's hilarious is by the time you get to kind of the third, fourth season of Boston Legal, and you know, and Spader is uh, uh, much heavier, and his hair is definitely thinning, and um, but they're still trying to play it off because Boston Legal is entirely all about. It, how excessively sleazy can James Spader be? And apparently there is no end to his sleaziness because they literally have scenes in like the fourth season where he sat there, you know, ballooning in weight, like I said, and his hair's all over the place and, you know, he's sweaty and blotchy and, you know, a 22-year-old <laughs> actress just off the bus in the tightest skirt they can possibly get walks past and Spader will appear at the door <laughs> like, some, like some kind of slimy, slithery <laughs> toad and be like, hello, my dear, and immediately they jump on his face. And I'm just like, it's, that itself is a sci-fi premise that any woman would at that <laughs> point. Um, but there's, you know, but I think that's what it was because up until Boston Legal, he's still sort of the James Spader that I think most women would agree, uh, you know, that, that they would uh, have fantasies about. But... By the time he, he finishes a Boston Legal, he's got that uh, Shatner stank on him, and I'm not, <laughs> not sure. I'm not sure he you can ever. Ha- he still has that it factor, though, because if you look at Blacklist, it, which is I, I like Blacklist, I like Blacklist a lot, but he's still sleazy. Oh, he yeah. still has that that aura presence about him, and like you said, it really doesn't matter how the guy looks because. He probably still does pretty well. <laughs> oh, of course. No, I mean, in the yeah. blacklist, he swans about in trilby hats and scarves, sipping tiny cappuccinos and oozing on absolutely everybody. And then on the other <laughs> hand, he's also like, you know, to- toting shotguns and like, you know, being all no nonsense. And yeah, so the Spader has still definitely completely got it. No, no doubt about it. Um, and, and what's funny about the blacklist, I think is because, uh, everyone, <laughs> they set it up. They clearly set it up for her to be his daughter. And then at the oh, beginning, yeah. when the beginning went, Oh shit, everyone realized that's how we set it up. So now they tried to rewrite it as something else. But, um, what's hilarious about that is if you're going to put, a, a spader in a, a TV series with opposite a female lead, you can't possibly make her, <laughs> no. her his daughter. He's got no. to be able to get into her pants at some point because that's all Spader really. That's his modus operandi. <laughs> and I wouldn't be surprised if he set up the blacklist simply to get into the woman's pants, only to then set up some other list to get into some other woman's pants down the road. I'm sure yeah, that's, uh, that's the that's red list. list. She's hot too. <laughs> that's that the red list. Right? The red list. That's going to be the uh, the unofficial spinoff. And by the well, time he's, the... by the time he's seventy five, it's going to be the beige list, and it's just going to be him <laughs> trawling old people's homes. Cat- looking part for... of the issue with with the blacklist, though, is that it's on NBC. That that show should have been on FX or even like HBO or something, because you need the real griminess to come out. And NBC just doesn't have it. And with NBC, you're always worried that they're going to cancel it, you know, in the middle of the friggin' season because it's NBC. You know what yeah. it needed. So... You know what it needed to be on. Was the USA Network circa 1994? <laughs> late night, <laughs> late up night. all night. Yep. But it, oh, the, yeah. the, the, what it needed was a cast worthy of Spader. The rest of the cast of the blacklist is, I mean, and I went look. I've only watched the first uh, couple of seasons, but like the the cast around him, including the leading woman whose hair is really weird. Um, it, it just looks like a wig and I can't get away from the fact that it looks like a wig and I'm like why is she wearing a wig and then we're like it's not a wig it's a real hair and I'm like it's completely bizarre um, 
the problem with it is is that there just isn't the cast around him to kind of support it. Whereas the nice thing about Boston Legal is as kind of sleazy and ridiculous and sort of the sexual politics of that show is all over the place, especially in 2018. But um, at least he had a cast around him that were equal scenery chewers. So he could kind of really relish playing back and forth with the blacklist there's no one for him to kind of play off so he really does just get to kind of swan throughout the show which is sort of a a joy in itself you know watching him kind of just breeze (laughs) between the raindrops in his own way and going off oh go ahead mark now spader's always been a guy i've been ambivalent on you know i think he's one of those guys that if you put him in a movie like you said you got to have a cast around him you got to have people that can emote because yep. he cannot emote. He just, he's, he's like a uh, serious George Clooney. You know? <laughs> well, he has, he has the, he can do pensive. He right. can do staring out of windows. He can do like sex <laughs> lives and videotapes. He can do the, I'll take my shirt off and rub my nipples while also having very deep thoughts about Kierkegaard or something, you know, like he's, right. he's that guy. He can, he can do comedy, he can do menacing, he can do... Um, but, like, the few times they've tried to put him in, like, either an action hero role or sort of a nerdy hero role or something like that, it just hasn't really uh, worked in, this, in the way that I think they hoped it would. No, um, what, he, what he should have done is he should have done the role as, of Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> I well, mean, like, that, oh, that has Spader all the fuck over it. S- Spader all over it. So we have a thing. I don't, I, <laughs> I don't know if you like guys that. have listened to any of the other episodes, but bringing up Buffalo Bill is a good example. So at the end of the show, when we've talked about Tough Turf and reviewed the film and, and, and voiced our opinion on it, at the end of the show, we do what object or what item or what person or what fluid or whatever did James Spader <laughs> take from the set of Tough Turf and then put in his... Sleazatorium. He has like, um, we believe he has like a sex dungeon basement sleazatorium somewhere that has various things. For example, we did the film, just to kind of give you a, a, a sort of flavor of it, we did the film Speaking of Sex with um, uh, Bill Murray, Catherine O'Hara, and a whole bunch of other people in it. It's a really <laughs> what bad a movie. Shit movie. Oh, it's such a bad <laughs> movie. Fucking movie. But the thing that I thought that he probably took from that movie was a, a science beaker worth of the hot tub water yes. in which Bill Murray and Catherine O'Hara have their sex scene. Because that's oh. the kind of thing Spader would want to take. He would want to take... He wouldn't take something obvious. Like, you know, if he was in a film with dildos or whatever, he wouldn't take the dildos. That's, that's too <laughs> right. obvious. He would have to take something that was like Ooh, fabric pubic or liquid. Hair. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, right, exactly. He would have to... Yeah, right. so that's, well, that's kind well, of... So, as he's, we talk about a, tough turf, keep that in the back of your mind. <laughs> oh, I love that. You said our concept with Duel of the Decades was money. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. This concept is money because you could do this with any actor on right. going forever. Like, this is, this is a great concept. That I'm never going to be able to watch a movie now without just doing this in my head. Like, oh, all <laughs> what right. What did he steal from the set? All right. Yeah. But Morgan. it would have to be so. It would have to be different things. So the sleazy actors, it would have to be like, what do they take in order to kind of either display later to freak out guests or maybe to arouse themselves or whatever it is. Oh, I, I don't or, even want to do it with the sleazy actors. I think it's more fun if you're like, all right, what did Morgan Friedman steal from this set of glory to put in his sex dungeon? <laughs> He's yeah. called Morgan Friedman. Morgan Freeman. Oh, they said Friedman. That was like his, some like no. Jewish guy. It was also <laughs> Morgan <in> Friedman. <laughs> the tr- the Mo- trouble Morgan is knowing, Freeman. knowing what we know about Morgan Freeman. It, yeah, I, 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 I hasten to think what he might have taken from any of the film sets. But no, you could do it. Yeah, you could do it just purely slee stuff. But then also, like I don't know if you have a particularly. A uh, boring actor or a weird actor, you could start having. They wouldn't have to have just sex dungeons. They could have, you know, uh, uh, different kinds of museums that they keep at their home to celebrate the careers. So, what do they take? Because I don't imagine. I don't know. I don't imagine like uh, uh, Bill Murray, for example, has a lot of like sex <laughs> stuff. But I imagine, for example, Dan Aykroyd probably took like bikes and guns and you know leather jackets and shit like that from his movies throughout the right. cuz he well, has he's that all whole into the persona. paranormal stuff 
Oh, right. So he'd probably take, like, ghostly things. Now, who you really could do this with, and it would be really fun, would be Bill Cosby. (laughs) uh, (laughs) Well, I don't know that he has got a whole lot of movies. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What did he take from Leonard Part 6? That's really what we want to know. He he took Um, Part 1 through 5 in two hours of my life. I will never fucking get back. Right. He took Robert's career. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I, I think he knocked me out for a few hours by watching that movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's where he got the idea from. He saw what a strong sed- sedative Leonard Part 6 was and just went from there. Um, <laughs> so, yes, as we've revealed in this conversation, we are covering this week Tough Turf from 1985. Uh, and it is indeed, I think, Spader's uh, first starring role. Um, and uh, it comes just before... Uh, the movie The New Kids, uh, which we did last season on uh, Sleazy Spader Springtime. And it's interesting because the the part of Morgan Hiller in Tough Turf uh, seems to have been kind of written for him in a weird way. Or certainly I can't imagine who else you would get to do the role. And the only reason I say that is because it's got to be a Connecticut waspy type uh, who's also a little bit rebellious, yep. who also women are going to go for... Uh, who also would show up in L.A. and both make friends and enemies like the very moment he shows up. And there's really, I can't think of anyone else in the Brat Pack who could play that, like those young actors at that time. There really isn't anyone else. I mean, maybe Judd Nelson, maybe he could play Waspy, uh, but but that's Paul about McCartney. it, really. Did you Sorry? say Paul McCartney? Oh, what the fuck is it? Yeah, I did. Paul McCartney? Oh, right. No, I know who you mean. You mean Andrew I, McCarthy. Andrew McCarthy. Andrew McCarthy. <laughs> Big fucking difference. Yeah, yeah. Well, you could bring him, too. Fuck it. He's waspy. Yeah. Well, and, Andrew McCarthy can do... Uh, he couldn't do the menacing thing. I don't think he can pull off nah. rebellious in quite the way that Spader... Spader has that, like, bubbling anger underneath him that, that kind of trans progresses into like sexual energy uh, <laughs> now here's a name you it, haven't thought of yet here's a name you haven't thought of yet who's that <laughs> jonathan silverman <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> no you can only do it with dead guys <laughs> leave leave silverman out of this uh <laughs> Just like all movies, please leave <laughs> Jonathan Silverman out of this. Exactly. That's the that's actually what they have. Like a lot of big Hollywood bigwigs just have a they probably have it crocheted, you know, like people have home sweet home or whatever, like <laughs> cross stitch. They just have leave Silverman out of this. Yeah. And um, the only part the only part that you have to pair up with somebody, and it'll answer the question right off the bat. Picture somebody on a ten speed bicycle. Shaking up a beer can. Actually, he didn't even shake it up. I guess he must have because he sprayed it at them, you know, right. that, that opening scene. Yeah. Picture any of these guys doing that. And if they can't do it, that's it. They, they cannot do the film. They yeah. can't do the film. Yeah, because you don't even really. And also, you've got to say, then on the other end of the spectrum, picture him uh, blooded carrying an axe and like storming up some staircases ready to attack a guy. And at the same time, imagine him. Imagining that same actor deflowering the like uh, high school hottie, and then at the same time imagining that actor standing back while that high school hottie does the most bizarre uh, dance scene that's been. <laughs> a movie oh my ever. god! What the fuck was that? <laughs> Who had a choreographed dance scene in a warehouse? Right. While while uh, freaking Robert Downey Jr. is playing drunk. Actually, before we go too far, and this ties into what you guys were saying before about uh, characters or actors that can play roles alongside of James Spader. And Robert Downey Jr. is definitely one of those guys. Yes. But if you look at every one of his 80s movies, and it really stuck out in this movie for me, he looks like a fucking vampire in the 80s. Dude, he's, <laughs> right. got, he's got pale skin. He's got dark circles around his eyes. His lips are like bright red. And in this movie, he was sweating throughout the entire movie, so he was probably coked out of his gourd. Oh, yeah. No, no definitely, definitely. <laughs> that pairing in this movie was magic, and that, that had to be one of uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s first roles, too. And a really interesting thing, I don't know if you guys seen this or if you picked it out, right after that warehouse scene that you were just talking about with the dance, when uh, James Spader's getting beat up by the gang right outside, on the wall is graffitied 
the new Avengers. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, Spader went on to be uh, Ultron, and you know, uh, everybody knows what Martin. Or I was called Martin Downey Jr. Uh, <laughs> not Morton Downey Jr., but Robert Downey Jr. You know, is, is Iron Man. That's the foreshadowing there. Is, oh yeah, completely blows my mind. But yeah. it also makes me laugh that later on in uh, uh, Less Than Zero, Ultron makes uh, Tony Stark blow people for. <laughs> For drugs. <laughs> uh, if if we're going to oh, assume man. if we're going to assume that the universes are like all connected, uh, <laughs> then in this early movie, uh, essentially Spader shows uh, Downey Jr. Uh, or Tony Stark rather, Ultron shows Tony Stark like the dark side of life because uh, obviously he shows him how to like fight and get shot in the leg and release uh, uh, Rottweilers. Um, and then in uh, Lesson Zero, he's like a sleazy drug dealer in L.A. And Tony Stark comes to him for help and he makes him blow people for, for drugs. <laughs> and then skip forward. I don't think, were they in any other movies together after that until Age of Ultron? I can't uh... think. They do those two movies and then, and I know they become friends and I know they've stayed friends. But I, I've got a feeling that they don't do many other films together Um Probably but, because he made them blow dudes. It, yeah, it's all exactly. part of the MCU. It's been going on forever. <laughs> this is all backstory <laughs> setting up these this characters. This is when Marvel didn't own any rights at this time, so they were setting it all up. They were the setting 80s. it all up back in the 80s. Well, they And there's, there's one other connection. They both obviously worked for um, uh, the guy who did Boston Legal and uh, Ali <laughs> McBeal. Uh, yes. Michelle Pfeiffer's husband, what's his name? Can't think of his name right now. But the guy who writes and uh, uh, produces those shows, because uh, Downey Jr. got his first comeback uh, as a character on Ally McBeal and then regressed again, uh, went back to prison or, or was certainly went back to rehab uh, and then got like his, his third <laughs> or second or whatever it was. Uh, reboot chant, with, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, with, I think, like the singing detective that Mel Gibson put him in and. He did, like, Gothica and a bunch of others, and he met his wife on Gothica, and then, like, he did kind of clawed his way back up through B-movies back into A-list. But, um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it's was. it been an interesting ride for uh, Downey Jr. and Spades this whole, you, whole You know time. what's amazing, though, about that, that mixture right there? And I know you, you watch a ton of movies, and we watch a lot of bad movies. And when you watch a bad movie, sometimes there's an there's a actor in the movie who just lifts himself above the movie. And this movie just, it wasn't the greatest movie in the world. I'll, I'll throw that out there right now. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't the greatest. But you look at Spader and Downey, and they just demonstrate in this movie that even the worst, terrible movies that are out, you could tell who has, you know, the, yep. the, God, the it factor, you know? And those two had that in this movie. Yeah, oh, yeah, completely. That had performances that stood out in any way shape or form in the entire right. film nobody oh, else definitely had the type of charisma that came across on screen but the, the and but the brat pack is is sort of a, a, a weird group of people as well because the, the although someone like a spader and, and a danny jr would obviously become big later on and and it makes sense when you see their performances and you you see their abilities. It's odd when you think of some of the other people, you know, like we've been mentioning Andrew McCarthy and Judd Nelson and stuff like that. It's odd to me that like Emilio Estevez became a big deal, like out of the. <laughs> I mean, I know yeah. he's Martin Sheen's son, but like out of all the guys in the Breakfast Club, for example, you think Judd Nelson is clearly going to go off and become like this huge star and he really doesn't i mean he you know he has his own cult thing but like he really doesn't whereas emilio estevez like he goes off and becomes and the same thing with like san elmo's fire uh yeah. demi moore comes out of san elmo's fire and demi moore becomes this huge star and when you watch san elmo's fire like demi moore really her like i mean okay but it, you know it's sort of it's sort of odd but yeah it's it's a weird group of actors but it, it is and the, the one who always got shit on and got the the short end of the straw i thought was ali sheedy as far as a quality actress she could, could hold not her agree own, with you more she could hold her own with just about anybody but never got the accolades it's that, the dan it's the dandruff scene man that, yeah yeah you that can't do it a, you can't do a dandruff scene and come back from that yeah, you can't go full dandruff. 
<laughs> yeah, you could, that's right. you could do a lot of things in the movies. Rebecca Gayhart went. Hair. Rebecca Gayhart went full Noxzema, and that started her fucking career. So come on, <laughs> a little dangerous. No, I'm I'm with you, dude. Like I was definitely the kid in high school that when I watched The Breakfast Club uh, as an early teen for the first time. Uh, I was Ali Sheedy all the yeah. way. Like, I did not get the Molly Ringwald thing at all. Um, I was Ali Sheedy all <laughs> oh, the way. Oh, I got way. it all right. But <laughs> <laughs> You know, they, it probably would have been better if they paired up Judd Nelson with Ali Sheedy rather oh, yeah. than Molly Ringwald. Oh, yes. the, I mean, just the age difference. You know, at the time they shot that, I think Judd Nelson was like 26 or 27, and Molly Ringwald was like 16. Yeah. And he had his head in between her legs and like shit you can't do yeah. anymore, you know? Yeah. And it, yeah, that was anyway. So there was obviously that whole thing recently where Molly Ringwald kind of wrote about the sexual politics in that movie. And right. uh, uh, anyway, let's not go down <laughs> <laughs> that road. Well, but uh, it, it was, let's talk back, uh, you know, tough turf. Tough you were just, we were, we were saying before that it's not the greatest movie. Did anybody else kind of get it's It's almost like the love child of, Romeo and Juliet, West Side Story, I got some Class of 84 in there, and The Outsiders, all, like, chopped up into, like, a one-man wolf pack, which is James Spader. And then you yes. make it an ABC after-school special. <laughs> it, with, it, tits, you know, with tits and go, uh, gore, yeah. Yeah, yeah they had... It, it was so, like, all over the place with this movie. Like, it's a little bit rom-com. It's a little bit teen, grimy action it's a little drama. Yeah, the it's, thing that makes so no much. sense. Yeah, the thing that makes no sense about Tough Turf is its wild mood swings. Yes. Uh, it doesn't stay in one realm very long. Like, if you saw the dance scene, is it Jack Mack and the Heart Attack or whatever the guy's Thank name you. is? All right. <laughs> uh, I am so glad we're getting into this this early. This is my absolute favorite thing about this film, and I loved it. That. It has no genre. And I love has, movies yeah, that are bold enough to do this because you look at the marketing and the acting and the clothes and it's, you know, 80s punk street kids. But the music is Chicago blues and swing and David Bowie's like shitty David Bowie cover bands. <laughs> and right. It, it's, it's so crazy that it's like it doesn't stick to anything that would have been considered popular culture at the right. time with the kids that are portrayed in the film. The closest it, you can kind of t is sort of stick it in that bucket of uh, teen rebellion, like 80s teen rebellion movies, of which there's like a huge ton. I mean, before we started talking about this film, we were talking about like Pump Up the Volume. That's definitely it, one. Right. I watched The Legend of Billie Jean the other day. That's definitely one. You've got um, uh, Class of 1984. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, a whole stream of them, and this sort of fits into that. But what's hilarious about Tough Turf, or what's genius about it, I don't know whether that's too strong a word, but is that <laughs> it, it, it goes, well, it, it, it doesn't have the strength of the conviction to be one thing, so it decides <laughs> to just throw everything at the stew and hopefully right. kind of come out with something that tastes reasonably good. Like, it's a... It's sort of a mat. Like, you wouldn't expect if you saw the scene where... If you saw any of the kind of violent and or action and or bullying scenes in the movie, if you just saw those scenes, and then you showed someone the um, dance scene to Jack Magna Heart Attack where she's whipping her hair about and she's dancing on tables and everything else, you know, which in reality you'd be like, lady, get off my <laughs> table, you're standing <laughs> in my suit. But, like, um, when if you put that scene and played that scene and then told someone it was from the same movie... They just, there's no way anyone would, they'd be like, no, it isn't. And you'd be like, no, it is. It's from the same movie. It doesn't make any sense, but it is. And then you put in the love scene, and but then there's also like a grimy, horrible, like molesting, possible almost rape scene. Like, it's so weird. Like the, the, and then you've got, oh, let's get the rebels, but they're the nice rebels into a car. And then they go to a golf course and there's all this sort of stuff. Like, it's totally all over the place. It is. It oh, just... it's, it's so all. Yeah, it's Ugh. completely, you know, it starts off completely fucked, too, because if you think about this fact that throws the whole movie off and it stuck in my head the entire movie. He's from Connecticut, right? He's, yeah, yeah he's a wasp from Connecticut. Oh, yeah. yeah, he's a wasp from Connecticut. His dad loses his job or his business closes, which they never really say what it is that his dad did. But they go and move from Connecticut 
to Los Angeles, which is not like the most fiscal decision in the world. <laughs> no, if no, you no, just no. lost your job. For your dad to leave work in Connecticut or lose his job, move all the way across the country where you have no family and become a yellow cab taxi driver. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's like what? I so through the on, on the Poop Culture podcast every now and then we do something where we throw out the proverbial bullshit flag. And right. I threw out the bullshit flag all over the dad on this movie. The casting was off. The storyline made no fucking sense because they go to hype up how rich in Connecticut upper crust this family was and how that, you know, they were they went to the country clubs and, you know, the prep schools and all that shit. The father was wealthy. I believe it was real estate he was in because he makes a comment that real estate law is about the same. Right now, is he a lawyer, though? Is he like a real estate lawyer? Like they yeah, don't fucking don't go know. into that at all. And his brother is going to school to be a lawyer, so you're like, right? So what? All right. So for somebody who's supposed to be so upper crust, this guy is the biggest fucking scrub I have ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> he like no fucking way that this guy gets into any country club, right? Like now the now the wife. And the brother are perfectly cast as like exactly you know upper upper class Connecticut toffs who are going to show up and be like I hate living in a you know ranch style house or bungalow right. or whatever they're living in. Um, you can to- totally understand that, but like you say, the father looks like there's no you know the father looks way more at home in a dirty holy t shirt <laughs> yes. and a pair of like baggy khakis than he it was looks. like they couldn't afford Harry Dean Stanton, so they oh, just totally. hurt this guy. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I would. So, I, I like to believe that this is the actor Harry Dean sends out to audition when even he can't be bothered to take a role. You know, Stanton will show up and that. yeah, Stanton will show up and work for a pack of Marlboros. But the, you know, this one film, he read the script and he was like, "If you could just get the dancing out of it, fuck the dancing." And they were like, "No, we have to keep the dancing. It, it kid yeah. appeal." He's like, "Fine, hire this guy then. He's my stand-in or something." Happen- that used uh, to happen all the time in the 80s you know for a while uh <laughs> the best what, what one of the things that is a delight about doing a podcast when you're when you when you look up the film on imdb um is, yeah, is, in, fucking... is in the trivia one of the best things ever that one someone bothered to sit and write down James Spader is merely lip syncing during the piano sequence. <laughs> oh, really? Really? He's lip syncing? Yeah. I hadn't realized. <laughs> All right, no, so I, the- I really tried to figure out if he was not singing there, if it was his voice. It was Neil Diamond. Like, that was clearly was Neil- a fucking Neil Diamond song. Oh, I mean, it could. It was the most awkward scene in the entire movie. Right. Yeah. Also, because. Because no matter what James Spader does, even when he's apparently serenading a woman that he likes on the piano, he looks like any minute he could either leap on her or stab her or, you know, (laughs) tear off all his clothes and start having face sex with an elderly woman. Like, you never know what Spader's going to do. And when he's singing, the way he's looking at her, he just can't pull off, like, intense attraction. He only comes across as, like... I am going to have you in a depraved way. That's and, kind of what he pulls off. It's and, I'm sh- and I'm really sure that he did. Because, oh, yeah. you know, that actress, she she didn't do a whole lot at that time. You know, she was a <laughs> wealthy, no, rich. No, no, woman. dude. She was in, hold on. No, she no, was no. in 48 different things to her credit until that movie. Yes. Which she showed her tits and lost her career. Who's her daddy? Which, which was a buddy double. Who's her daddy? Oh, that was a her, I know she's a fucking Hilton. Like she's yeah. her. Yeah. <laughs> well, she's actually she's not a Hilton. She's her sister, right? It's... Married into the Hilton, so she's actually Paris Hilton's uh, aunt, right? But the the, but the, the whole right family in. was a movie movie producers, and it was Hollywood, yeah. and you know. So well, you, actually, you know what she's best known for? She was the little girl that gets shot in the fucking chest in uh, Salt and Precinct Thirteen. That was her. <laughs> That was her. Oh, man. No wonder she had no Which tits. was her best role. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking shotgun blast will do that, man. Yeah. That's Scuffed such a tough scene to watch. It is. 
But yeah, like she's horribly miscast as a tough chick too in that. And that's Kim Richards that we're talking right. about. But she yeah. She's not like a tough chick and you know, that first time that Morgan meets her, he just like breaks through her badassness in like you know, 10 minutes. He's forcing her to dance with him during that awkward dance scene and she's not trying that hard to get away from him. And we keep going back to that dance scene, but that's like a pivotal point of this movie. It is. My other favorite Frankie scene is one of the only scenes where it's only her alone in the entire movie. And that's when she's in the mirror and she switches characters and she, she tries to become that Connecticut upper crust, you know, socialite just for a minute. And then yeah. she, she realizes how fucking ridiculous she sounds. Yeah. She's kind of trying to see if it. she can, uh, if if Spader is the one for her, whether right, right. whether she can be a, a woman for him. But like the funny thing about that is, is that Spader doesn't really uh, want that. Like Spader is rebelling from that Connecticut <laughs> thing. Exactly. Um, it's 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 his mother that wants that. Like it's almost like she's trying this stuff on to see if she'll fit in with his mother, not with him. Like he's all like leather jackets and jeans and. You know, get me out of here, and he he doesn't want any part of the Connecticut madness. He 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 doesn't really fit in anyway. He doesn't fit in with the uh, East LA thugs either. You know, he's got. I'm a... pretty sure he's bipolar in this movie because he goes from. <laughs> I think so. If you notice this as you watch this, and I watched this three nights in a row because uh, John and I were supposed to do this episode a couple weeks ago, and I got to watch it over a weekend, so I was like, I'll just do it three nights in a row. Fuck it, and. I noticed by the third time that he's either wearing a sweater, and that's when he's the normal kid. Yep. <laughs> and then when, whenever he's wearing the leather jacket, bad shit's going to happen. Yes. Yeah. Did you notice that? Yeah, he's in badass mode at that point. Like, he's yeah. gone except, full badass. Except for the dart gun scene in his bed, which is another bizarre scene. There's right? cockroaches in the house. That pissed me <laughs> off. Only in his room. That, that Only in his room. That was in the first 30 seconds of the movie, and I shit you not, it almost ruined the entire movie for me. I wanted to turn it off at that point. And no, that's not the cockroaches? Yes. So what no, happens? That's, for, he, that, that's a little bit later. That's after... He gets beat. No, that's after the whole bike thing. No, this is in the very. That's in the opening sequence of the movie. Is I it believe. really? In the it's credits. Where you, no, although the bike, you, the although bike you, is in the credits. When you see the bike sequence, uh, uh, where he uh, breaks up a mugging um, at the beginning of the movie, you don't really see his face. And then the next right. morning is when he wakes up um, and shoots cockroaches oh, okay. from across yep. the room right. with a dart gun. And what's amazing about that is. It's it's as if to say, so he has pinpoint accuracy with exactly. these weapons, it, it and ruined he's also the movie. well, yeah, because <laughs> later on in the movie when he actually has the dark guns and he has to shoot at the bad guys, uh, he misses like three or yeah. four times. I'm like, well, hang on, you can hit a cockroach across the wall, but you can't hit hit an enormous human being from like just downstairs. <laughs> right. It doesn't Mo- really make movie making sense. 101. You cannot introduce such a random object that early in a movie and ex- not expect people to realize this will have major significance later. Like you almost should put up a sign. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Notice this object. We're going to highlight it now for you. <laughs> <laughs> he should have been in gotcha after that. Whole scene. Um, so, so yeah. So then he kind of, uh, he goes to school, he gets his bike trashed by the bullies. So, what the, and then, obviously, like, then the movie kind of spirals out of control because Spader wants to uh, uh, go out with... And, in fact, the whole... His whole problems is then predicated on the fact that Spader has to nail this chick. He just has to. He's seen <laughs> the woman. He's seen the woman. He's like, I'm James Spader, goddammit. She shouldn't be with this 45-year-old playing a high school kid. <laughs> Like it's like Dude, that's he's Nick Hauser you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, but he's, he's like he's like forty five, like a the fucking best, four day scene. four day stubble, we're, and like he looks like someone off Dexy's Midnight Runners or something. <laughs> we're talking about that one scene where they, uh, you know, he comes outside where they got his bike or whatever while he's at school, and uh, Robert Downey Jr. like stops him because he's going to get his bike, and he goes, "That's Nick Hauser." <laughs> like, <laughs> 
fucking Nick Hauser. Who the fuck is Nick Hauser? It's also he weird, like, you know, you. like, he, he just... <laughs> played by uh, Paul Moniz or Moniz? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He was in uh, Saints and Sinners and Double Team. Wow, what a career. Oh, yeah. yeah he Once looks, you do Double Team. He looks like a member of the Warriors. You know, he looks like a budget warrior. He looks like the kind of warrior... <laughs> They'd wake up if the other four couldn't show. You know what I mean? Right, right. right. He was uh, war- yes. warrior number six. <laughs> he was always late for the meets. Right. You know what I mean? That's 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 who he looks like. Um, and uh, yeah, he like no. There's no real agenda for him other than to just kind of go around the place committing random acts of violence and vandalism. And what's hilarious is the only time the police show up in this town is when Spader needs them to when he. Spader steals a car, right? And then uh, they steal the car from him, but really they've stolen the car now from the person Spader stole the car from, (laughs) and then they get arrested, and then they're out of the movie for, like, a minute so that Spader can kind of get to know the chick. Um, But, like, what's, what's... crazy is the rest of the time they're like smashing up shops they shoot a guy with like <laughs> three witnesses nothing ever happens like, <laughs> like better what? yet how did they get out of jail yeah i couldn't figure they that stole, out they stole a car there that dude doesn't have any fucking money to bail himself out no they stole they a have, stolen car they yeah. have a really good thug lawyer what they should have done <laughs> Is just to make a twist on it, they should have had Spader's dad come out of retirement as a lawyer <laughs> and get them out of prison, and Spader doesn't know about it until later, and then they shoot the dad. That that would have, like, a whole twisty-turny thing in it. You know so I mean? much better than him being a cab driver, I'll tell you that. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I think we can merge some 80s, franchise, 80s 90s franchises together here. What if uh, Rufus from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure came down in the phone booth and brought James Spader's character from Boston Legal back <laughs> to help these two kids. What? And then he goes up to younger Spader and goes, this is what you become! Exactly! This is yeah. what you... <laughs> or they could have just killed Spader and then Rafferty could have came and got him from the oh, Heavenly Kid. Yes! And oh, then he would have been like, the oh, dude! There's so many different directions this movie could have went to make it make it good. Yeah, and but why it's... the fuck did Universal try that Universal monsters shit, man? They could have just done something like this. Exactly, just get Spader, have two different worlds colliding. It would have been amazing. Um, but no, the 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 Connecticut thing is the thing that kind of bothers me because I feel like. There was a version of this script, and then when they met Spader, they were like, well, let's cast him, but it doesn't work that he's from wherever he was originally in the script. And I feel like they then did the Connecticut thing for because they cast Spader, but then everything else ceases to make sense. Like, it's almost like they wrote one thing, and then it doesn't make any sense that all these other things happen, I feel there's like. No, there's no freaking country clubs in California that they could have used instead. Right, exactly. It's just sort of odd. And like you say, the dad is a total scruff. So um, maybe but their it's... story was bullshit. <laughs> maybe they were just, you know, saying, oh, yeah, we're from Connecticut. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah you're from Connecticut. Yeah, you're from fucking Danbury. Okay. <laughs> Witness protection. Hey, what are you saying? My fiance is from Danbury. I'm not even kidding. My fiance is actually from Danbury. Connecticut. What are hey, you saying? Speaking, speaking of dads. Yes. Why is Frankie's dad so excited that she's going to get married to his loser, Nick Hauser? He's <laughs> like, this dude is so ready that he, you know, he says yes for her. Right, and then he's ready to party. Comes up to her stairs with fucking bubbly. And, oh, also, you know, he's like he just won the pennant. He's way older than all the other dads, and like, why is he a single dad? And yeah, I mean, there's there's so many questions about Frankie and and well, that. That scenario. got explained. That oh, Frankie did? Frankie's mom died earlier that year from cancer. Oh, that was like right, a whole. Right, right. That's why she had the <laughs> meltdown at the dinner when somebody brought Guys, it up, even though they yeah. didn't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I watched this a while ago. Um, <laughs> we've been trying to put this episode together for like three weeks. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, okay. Yeah, all right. Her, I'm, her, I'm, mom all right, died yeah. of cancer. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that drove me nuts about the movie was how the parents were portrayed. 
I thought that Morgan's dad, Frankie's dad, were complete. Were they were portrayed as completely blind to what was really going on with their kids. Like, the whole thing with Frankie's dad, obviously, the guy who is going to marry your daughter is a complete fucking scumbag. Right. And the father is oblivious to this. He's he also 45. Yeah, yeah, he's also yeah. 45. And this Morgan, should be a massive warning. And still in high school. And like, Morgan's, you're 45. Still. Morgan's dad He's comes, on his seventh senior year. <laughs> And Morgan's dad comes home, sees his son has had the shit beat out of him, and he is covered in scars, and basically tells his son, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Just, just go Life's do it. Life's a puzzle. Yeah. Life, life's a puzzle. You got you to gotta do what you feel is right. <laughs> like, life's a puzzle. Grab some dart guns and an axe. Right? And... <laughs> like, the parents are completely oblivious to what is going on, and it drove me nuts because, you know, I'm a parent now. But I think maybe in 85, when I watched this for the first time, I was like, yeah, these fucking parents are idiots. Yeah, they, they don't know. Nobody knows what's going on with us. But when you look back at it as an adult, it's a totally different perspective. And it drives you nuts that they wrote the characters like this because that's not how you'd handle it. Well, the mother is. The mother and the, the brother. The mother's not bad. No, 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 no. The mother and the brother are awful characters. Not not so much in the movie, but like the actress, the actress and the actor are fucking terrible. Oh, Morgan's like mother. Yeah, Morgan's mother. Oh, when like they're talking, when she's mother. talking to the brother, there's there's like, did you say Frankie's mother? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> she was she was good, but when they were talking, there's like gaps in the dialogue where there's like these weird pauses, like they're waiting for something else to be said, and they were just like, <laughs> ah, screw it, just put it together, it's fine. And then why? The brother went, like, after the dad gets shot and the brother confronts Morgan, he does nothing. He does nothing. He just nothing. confronts him and that's it. Nothing. And Spader doesn't do anything either. And don't tell me that he does, okay? This guy is bullying you, okay? It, that's why I say ABC After School Special. It's a movie about bullying. So the whole movie, beginning opens up. Look, Spader's got guns. First two minutes of the movie, you know where this is going. And then he teases with the cop. Hey, you ever shoot anybody with that thing? Pointing out the oh, cop's gun. Yeah. So that's twice in the first half an hour that they've teased that there is going to be a shooting or a school <laughs> shooting scenario. Then well, hold on, this before you go too far, Mark. What? Mark, before you go too far, the uh, the cop. We got it, the fucking cop. He perfect scene from what you guys said earlier. It's Carl Winslow. Like. Where the fuck are the cops? That cop's busting his balls for driving his bike on school yes. property. Yeah. Meanwhile, he's getting run down by a car. Nobody's even there. Yeah. Oh, no, that's what's shit. hilarious. The entire school comes out to watch him basically be like the, I don't know, the sandwich in like a chicken game. Or what, what do I mean? Like the, the meat in a chicken sandwich with the two cars <laughs> coming at him. You know what I mean by that. Yeah, the two I cars saw, are playing I, chicken I, with him, right? And, I saw and, a video once with a guy who had some meat and a chicken sandwich. Yeah, yeah. James, J, James Spader's two girls, one cup. It's a, it's a <laughs> interesting, but uh, <laughs> it's a whole other thing. But uh, no, so he's right. He's being run down by like uh, again, like vintage cars that these forty-five-year-olds who are still yeah. in high school can afford, and um, <laughs> no one's anywhere to be seen whatsoever, except all the skid- kids are out of school. The, the principal doesn't come out. The, the security guard doesn't come out. The police aren't called. Nothing happens at all. And, so they, end uh, up yeah. sh- they end up shooting. He shoots Morgan's dad. This dude yes. shot your fucking dad. Yes. You, go, you still go after him with dart guns. That's the yes. best you can come up with. Well, you that's all shoot, he had. You don't he call shoots co- his dad, and there's like three witnesses. And the <laughs> thought isn't to go, let's all get together and go to the police. Right. He, we know who did it, how they did it. You know, like Game completely over. bizarre. Yeah, well, not yeah. No, yeah Frankie, it's, it's, Frankie witnesses the murder. She like she's a credible witness. She's been yeah. seen with a guy. They know. Right. It's yeah. It's totally bonkers. How and it's is also, he not mad at her? Right. When he finds out that she knows, she tells him because he has no lust. emotion. 
Spader's lust knows no bounds. It really does. <laughs> so in this in this series of Sleazy Spader Springtime that we've done this year, uh, one of the movies we did was called Starcrossed, which, although it's like a weird TV movie after school special that also tries to put in like Christian metaphors and mentioning of God <laughs> and the Bible and stuff, it's really all about Spader wanting to nail a chick and save the universe. That's really what the, the film's about. And this Quality. movie... This movie is is hands down the movie where Spader is like, I have got to nail this chick at, at any cost, and it doesn't matter if my dad gets shot, if I get beaten up with, like, socks so full true. of... Uh, uh, um, keys, what, right? Keys, keys and, and that's, yeah. uh, padlocks is the word padlocks, I'm looking for. Yeah. Uh, uh, padlocks across my back, and it doesn't matter if my friend gets shot in the leg, and none of this matters, because it only matters that I got to uh, pop the cherry... And then end and then end up being with the girl in in the the girl that everyone wants to be with in high school. And you know for a fact that after a couple of Jack Mack and the Heart Attack concerts, he's out of there and onto the next yeah. check. <laughs> like Fuck all this will have been for curve. nothing. <laughs> so true. It's oh, so yeah. fucking true. <laughs> and you know it leads up. You talked about. Uh, you said it right there where uh, Robert Downey Jr. gets shot in the leg. That final fight scene it feels like it's like 40 minutes long yeah did it not yeah Yeah. everyone gets beaten about the face and head and neck multiple times well they think still able to deal with it everyone thought that the shrapnel that tony stark got was from that uh iud in the (laughs) the humvee it was actually (laughs) right it was actually from the bullet fragment from when he was shot in tough turf that, Either that know. or the, the fact that he got shot and then probably got put on prescription painkillers led oh. to the drugs that he oh. needed to get in less than zero. Yep. I'm, I'm pretty sure he was on drugs in this movie, too. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> you know. he, is, he is 110% high on coke the whole time. Yeah. Which reminds uh, he still me did of, well. See, in my, my favorite Downey Jr. movie, I go back to his early years, and uh, that's 1969 that he did with Kiefer Sutherland. Oh, I thought that's he was a great film. Absolutely phenomenal performance in that. I think and that's another his one that's like performance. not. It's another one that's not been kind of rediscovered. Right. Um, it's and it's also weird. I don't know if you guys have found this, but like with all the movies that are coming out that that have these actors that are like now that that like a Downey Jr. Um, who sort of have this big back catalogue of films. It's really odd to me that. Um, when you speak to someone who's a little younger about, like, Robert Downey Jr. or whatever, they still only know him from the Marvel Universe. And not nobody's bothered to go, what did he yep. do before? Or even care, because it's not Iron Man. You know what I mean? And it's, it's sort of weird, because I don't know about you guys, but, like, I got into movies because growing up, you would watch films, and you'd be like, I really like that guy, or I really like right. that movie, or whatever. And then you would find out who the director was, and you would watch all the movies by that director, or you would find out who that actor was and try and find... Like, I used to do that all the time with different actors, and no one does that anymore. Like, you talk to people, and they're like, well, I don't know, I'm 20. What do I know about anything? And you're like, well, (laughs) you should know something. I knew something by the time I was 110 percent correct on that. I I have an 8-year-old son now, and I'm starting to do the same thing with movies and music with him and getting him used to it. It's like, he'll find something he likes... But I have to explain to him, okay, why do you like this? You have to understand the people that made this movie, what they liked, and then you will understand where they were going with this. Well, you know, you can't yeah. just go, you, you can't just jump into to new music. You got to start with the Beatles. You got to start with Zeppelin. Get your building blocks and then go from there. You know, don't just jump to Tarantino. You know, start with no, Hitchcock. Well, ne- ne- Never jump to Tarantino. Always no. go back to the movies that Tarantino is remaking. That's it, what you do. Right, exactly. <laughs> but Actually no, the, the, watch uh, Spaghetti Westerns. Right, exactly. <laughs> the, but the, no, the thing that always... Uh, I, the story I always tell is that I was about nine, ten years old when the Beatles anthology first ran, that big documentary that they did, that six-part thing, and uh, was a big Beatles fan because my mum was a hippie back in the 60s and had all the vinyl and everything. But... Um, it was the the bits that I remember was them talking about like they would mention like Fats Domino or Big Bill Brunzi yeah, or yeah. someone like that, and I'd be like, okay, who? What are these names? This sounds amazing. Like I would try and then find that stuff, and I I got really into biographies, not so much to 
uh, hear the story of the person, although that was great, but also to hear the stuff that influenced the person, like exactly like you were saying, like that to me is fascinating. You know, I want to know what Bruce Springsteen listened to growing up. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's the stuff I want to then listen to, to see like how he became who right. he was or whatever it is. You know? I hate to go, go back to music cause we're talking about movies, but it, it really is a good metaphor for this, you know? And I, I think that you kind of go back to, Oh geez. How do I want to, how do I want to put this into words here? All right, skip it. Just go on. I'll, I'll well, come you, back to it. If you, you could bring it back to the movie because you could go, I want to know what inspired Jack Mack and the heart attack. Like, what were they <laughs> thinking when they were like, let's hire this gnome-like dwarf of a lead singer who is neither attractive nor particularly talented. Let's back him up with, like, 17 horn players and one drummer. Let's just... Let's think about that, and let's see if we can't get some country club swing in with some of that. That thing. was, it was uh, Tyler Labine was Jack Mack and the Heart Attack, right? I think uh, it looked. I looked just like Tyler Labine. I'm pretty sure. Oh, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I didn't, I didn't you, delve you, that you, deep you, into you that. You Google up Jack Mack and the Heart Attack, and you Google up a picture of Tyler Labine. It's and the, same, the same, fucking, thing. same dude, like thirty years difference. Well, well also, if you guys want to keep it with movies. All you got to do is just go back to Fritz Kirsch, the guy that directed this film. And did you like Children of the Corn? Yes. Exactly. You know? Not my favorite. Not my favorite. Malachi! Yeah. Who then ends up being in The Burbs, which is hands yes. down one yes. of the greatest movies ever made. Uh, Thank but the, you. Um, yes. It is, it is one is of the phenomenal. greatest fucking comedies of all time. It is it is a perfect script, perfect cast, perfect Matter direction. Fact, There's nothing wrong with it. They actually now they have a kids game. My son was playing a fucking video game, and I'm watching him play this game. And the way the game is portrayed, I'm like, this is the fucking burbs. <laughs> There's a game out there called Hello Neighbor, and you kind of sneak into this creepy neighbor's house, and you can't. Right. You're trying to investigate what he's really up to, and. You know, if he sees you, he'll chase you. It's the fucking burbs. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, I need to now track down that game. But no, you know what else this guy directed, Mark? I'm sorry. Real quick here. No, go Mark ahead. I know this one. Remember uh, Winners Take All? I sure do. Yeah. He also directed that. He did? Yeah. It's, it, it, okay. So look at that's almost I think it's back to back to back. So he did Children of the Corn, Tough Turf oh. and Winners Take All. Three movies that have you would never know if you watch those back to back to back no. that it was the same director. What about no. the fact that he also makes gore with Oliver Reed? That is tremendous. That he then goes into the like eighties fantasy cheese ball. Uh, you know, is it the future? Is it the past? Is it on this planet? Is it not? Oliver Reed walking around with a massive mad helmet on and lots of women in leather. That's yeah. That's tremendous that he made gore. I don't know if you guys <laughs> have seen Palance. it, but it's Jack Palance. Yeah, indeed. It's uh, I've only seen it once, but I remember thinking this is one I need to go back to because it's uh, fascinating. <laughs> uh, that guy had quite the career, this director. Uh, and he works with Anthony Michael Hall uh, in a, and Michael Pere, no less. Wow. Wow. Uh, in in Into the Sun, a movie I've actually never seen. Huh. There, I need to there's check your that next out. episode. There is there. I need to check that out. Michael Prey and Anthony Michael Hall. That's that's uh, phenomenal, man. Hey, if Eddie uh, Wilson's in it, I'm all over it. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Eddie and the Cruisers meets the Breakfast Club in fighter jets. <laughs> oh god, it's he would it's a he would have fucked Molly Ringwald all over that friggin' cafeteria. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> So it's it's a fighter pilot is reluctantly paired with a Hollywood actor who's researching a role, but are then forced to team up for real after being shot down and thrust into combat. I have got to see that movie. <laughs> this is this is Iron Eagle Five, right? right. <laughs> basically, uh, basically, um, but yeah, no so, chappy. But the, the other thing that's so the, the, talking about the music in Tough Turf, there's there's. Not one, but three bands, it, like um, uh, bar bands, uh, uh, the country club band, yeah. the, the warehouse band. There's like three bands in the movie. I'm a big fan of um, really weird, like when they go into a bar or into a club or something in a movie, and for some reason 
they focus on the band for 30 seconds before the thing. And you go, they're not a band you've ever heard of normally. Yep. They're just some, like, mad pub band. with. And you wonder, is that a friend of the director? Is that someone's <laughs> uncle? Is that just some mad bearded hobo they dragged in off the street to blow into a harmonica? Like, what? what is going on there? There's, there's one in um, uh, Overboard, Kurt Russell and uh, uh, Goldie Horn go into a bar and a guy's just com- like completely mad singing about something that you're just a, it's just a wonderful sequence you're like I've ne- no one's ever heard of this band since uh, we were watching um, a movie uh, Rainbow Drive the other day with Peter Weller in it and they go into a, a nightclub and uh, there's a band in there and it's always it always seems to be run by the same people who think uh, they, they have like the big Kenny Rogers hair and beard combination that seems to be Standard yep. for film bar bands. And I don't know why, but it's my, wonderful. My favorite, well, I know exactly what you're talking about, and it's these little cameos from unknown mu- musicians that are just, the scenes go on forever, and you never hear from these musicians again, and sometimes... Mark, can I guess yours? <sighs> go ahead. I, oh, I'm going to be so pissed if you get it. Roadhouse. No, it is not. Oh, all right. It is not. Roadhouse is like my second favorite one because that guy is an incredible fucking guitarist. Also, he he had a legitimate. He he had a legitimate music career. Yeah, Jeff Healy was incredible. But no, where I'm going is a movie that I know you're familiar with too, and that's Better Off Dead, and that is the (laughs) title song (laughs) Better Off Dead that was sung by this beautiful woman. That can you picture any other thing that you might have seen her in? She's always singing and shit. She was no, dotty. Was she? she ran the bicycle shop for Pee Wee. <laughs> she was. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. Oh, wow. I yeah. had never figured and that she, out. And she sings the title song from Better Off Dead in a scene that, out of blue, just put a musical number in the middle of this comedy from an unknown artist who's not even a real, not even a real singer. Just a, we're going to write a song for an actor to portray and it was fucking and great. That had to be her voice. That was it her was voice her voice. Sure. Yeah. It absolutely was. She had that squeaky, like weird voice. Yes, yep. it was hot as shit. <laughs> Fuck, I might rub one out to that tonight. God, I love that movie. <laughs> so don't uh, go too hard. <laughs> <laughs> as if as if there wasn't enough music already in the thing, we get James Spader badly uh, uh, mouthing that song, which we've already talked about. Um, do we have any other kind of big things we want to say about the movie? I've got uh, we've got then a couple of things to wrap up before we finish. But um, that scene, that one scene, we I think it would be an injustice if we didn't mention her friend talking to the snobby prude chicks oh, about right. sucking dick. <laughs> and, yes. and the best line of the entire movie, all hundred and fifty <laughs> odd minutes, whatever it is, is when she looks at the girls and goes. You guys swallow, right? Yeah. And they're all like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah totally. <laughs> I, guess, <laughs> it's the best. I guess my parting shot on this is uh, if you're going to make a movie that's supposed to connect with teenagers and kids and it's supposed to portray a serious message, which I really think that's what they were trying to do with Tough Turf, here's a tip. Really? Here's a tip. <laughs> Put things in the movie that kids actually like if you're trying to connect with kids. They don't listen to Chicago blues. They don't listen to Neil Diamond. You know, they don't give a <laughs> they fuck. They probably did in the eighties. <laughs> no, no, they didn't listen to this shit because Mark, when they this drives her point home right here. Okay, the movie's rated R, right? Yeah. And who's it focused at? High school kids. So that means three quarters of the kids in high school couldn't even see the movie because they weren't seventeen years old or older. Oh, so we're, we, so the older gentlemen were supposed to go and you know <laughs> fantasize about Frankie. I, I suppose so, because like they made it rated R. What were you going to do? Wow, and they wonder why there's so many fucking problems in Hollywood today. You know, come on, yeah. just enjoy the movies, people. Jeez, it did. You know what? All the shit we talk about this movie, it was a legitimate release, and I, I posted it, it on Twitter today. It actually got released to the movies. It made like ten million bucks. So it wasn't like, you know, then they probably spent nothing on this movie. Yeah. It was nobody. None of these guys were big actors. It was the 80s version of 13 Reasons Why. <laughs> really? <what? laughs> I, I was waiting for Frankie to kill herself at the end and leave cassette tapes everywhere. <laughs> I really thought that that's where this was all going. 
Also, what, she was going to use reel to reel. She was going to use uh, eight track. Uh, oh, there oh, we go. <laughs> but no. So, um, <laughs> what? What? Uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, no, I was going to say like the eighties. It's the first time in sort of thirty years that you have like a wave of teen movies again, and once they start making them, they can't stop. Like the fifties going into the early sixties, it's like teen movie after teen movie after teen movie. Like whenever I've seen sort of Roger Corman talk about like his early films and yeah. the stuff that he was making and stuff, he's like, we just wanted to know what would play to teenagers, and we would just make teen movies until that dried up in sort of the mid sixties. Once you start getting. Uh, some of the more um, adult and political and stuff that's going to move through into the film brats of the 70s. Uh, and then it's all adult. Like, the 70s is almost entirely focused on uh, young to middle-aged adults. Like, all the movies that come out by until you get, like, Star Wars and stuff. But, I mean, even then... Um, it's filled with actors that are more likely going to appeal to an older audience. Oh. And then suddenly you get like the wave of, of eighties movies. Um, but like you say, it's sort of, some of them are bizarrely R rated and you're like, well, okay, yeah. who's this movie for? But that's what, like, I have to say in, in closing about this particular movie, but, but, but then I have two more questions. Um, it, the conclusion I always come when I watch a movie like this uh, from this era, and I think the same probably happens with you guys when you're doing your um, uh, decade uh, episodes, is you just, and you know, it sounds like such an old man thing to say, but it's true, you just don't get movies like this anymore where they throw five genres into a soup mixer and go, this will, like, just put that out there, stick a couple of, like, if you think about it, James Spader and Robert Downey Jr. weren't even names at this time. So this is a movie filled with no names whatsoever that has, like, it appeals to everyone and nobody all at, one, all at once. And yet <laughs> Which means right. you appeal to nobody. Right. right. And yet it makes a respectable $10 million. It's, it's part of a ongoing series of both teen and or teen rebel movies, um, which don't die down. I mean... Uh, how late is Pump Up the Volume? Isn't that quite late? That's yeah. 90, I think. Yeah. 91. 91 yeah. yeah. So this wave of, you know, teenagers against authority goes, and, you know, and you get the sex romps of the 80s, you get the slasher films of the 80s, you get the Brat Pack movies of the 80s, like huge swathes of just like teen film after teen film after teen film. Um, and it's sort of funny that they then call like, the American Pie stuff of the early 90s, sort of a revival, because not really a revival, it kind of, you could probably, there's probably some late 80s, early 90s sex romps that kind of blend into that. It's just a revival in the sense of giving it a bigger budget, but pretty much. It all, it all kind of blends into each other. Uh, but no, my last two questions then, obviously we have the James Spader Sleazatorium, which will be our last thing, but before that, we've recently had uh, um, Cobra Kai on YouTube Red, uh, which has taken um, <laughs> it has Love taken it. the uh, um, uh, Karate Kid franchise and brought it up to present day. Uh, there is a uh, movie web article that suggests the same could be done with Tough Turf. So, uh, off just off the top of your heads, uh, Rick, you go first, and then Mark, um, give us your thirty second pitch for what you would like to see in a Tough Turf. YouTube Red reboot, if we could get the original cast back together for the money that YouTube would pay, which is probably a ham sandwich and a blowjob or something. Holy shit. Well, you know what? It's, it's tough to do another one. What I would like, if they could do it, would be a prequel to explain, <laughs> number one, how the fuck they got to California from Connecticut. What, why he got kicked out of, what did he get kicked out of two schools? What's the story there? Because the, there's no backstory. It's just all hearsay about it. Right. So I'd want to see that instead of just seeing this movie done. As Mark knows, I hate fucking reboots. So if they can give me a backstory, yeah. I'd want to see that. Yeah, maybe but his what, whole backstory is all complete fabrication. So would you have, in Wet Hot American Summer style, James Spader playing the oh, younger God. James Spader? <laughs> 
<laughs> before like you it's the prequel but it's still james spader would you have that or would you cast some blonde waspy kid no you cast I, james spader and you do to him what they did to robert downey jr in the marvel movies <laughs> so you're gonna go full-blown <laughs> cgi youth no, spader. no no no, no. Spa- <laughs> it would Spader's still gotta move stay more than it. spader it would be the Spader's uncanny be valley the dad. all over the place <laughs> spader's the dad now yeah See, okay, they got to go back and bring him back as the dad. That's no, where I go with this. He's not grubby enough to be the dad. He's not thinking... short and grubby and skinny enough. He's too podgy and <laughs> They make him the lascivious. principal of the high school. He's got to be in it some way. Right. But that's it. He did, it doesn't fit. And I'm not a huge fan of uh, Wet Hot American Summer. I, it's funny in parts, but I can't get into it for the entire stretch. Oh, love it. So I th- I think you need to recast it. He, you have to have him in it, but just recast it with some other kids like they did in uh, Cobra Kai. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, could, no, but the two main guys in Cobra Kai are still the same actors, right? Yeah. True, but the fighters are different. That's that's right. the only. But they're, are difference. they playing the same part? They're playing the same parts, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're still Daniel and uh, and Billy Zapka is still uh, what the fuck's his name? Uh, Johnny. 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 Yep. Johnny Lawrence. Yeah. All right. So uh, okay, so Mark, your uh, pitch, your elevator pitch for the <laughs> uh, YouTube Red Tough Turf sequel, prequel, reboot, whatever you want to call it. All right. Well, where I go with this one is I go full blown sequel, and I go Tough Turf Two, Tougher Turf, and what it is now <laughs> is it's Spader and Frankie, and you kind of take right. a take a take a page out of. Back to the Future 2. So it's okay. now them older with mirror images of themselves as their children now dealing with the exact same scenarios that they dealt with in the first movie, except now they're not going to be completely oblivious parents. They'll have, but they have to be divorced. Yeah. There's no way they, well, no. No way they stood together. <laughs> I'm sorry, but in the sequel, Frankie ain't going to be in it because much like her mom, she ain't going to make it to this film either. <laughs> no, no, they're, they're divorced, but Spader insists that they still have sex on occasions. That's what it is. <laughs> He's like, yeah, we're, we're, we're divorced, so I can go off with other chicks, but I occasionally go back to Frankie. Right. Um, and then that way, you can have them like get back together properly at the end, knowing full well that if Tough Tough Three is ever made, he'll be single again. <laughs> Right. Well, Mark, just... Mark just killed her off. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, no. I don't... <laughs> well, goddamn Ultron's gonna bring her back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I... And and I think, do we think that Danny Jr. would be cool and hip enough to make a cameo for like no money, considering he's now a multi-billionaire? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, okay, he, he, cool. he can't get any more money. He doesn't. You don't. People don't understand that. He has all of the money. All, so there's all no. The money. There's no yeah. more. He's got it all. I think it, so. I think it'd be really funny if, in Tough Turf the sequel, even though it's like forty years later or whatever, he's still walking with crutches, <laughs> <laughs> and he still can't like fucking drive. Yeah, his he's leg is just school. never. His leg's <laughs> never healed. That one thing where he got shot in the leg has held him back uh, from everything in his life. Those goddamn that, leather pants amazing. are gonna have to. You're gonna have to peel them <laughs> off by this point. <laughs> Still um, trying to fit into so, them. <laughs> so, and then the last, so the last question then is, guys, uh, and Mark, you can go first with this one. What do you think uh, Spader kept from this film that he put into his uh, modern day sleazatorium in his like museum of filth? Well, as, as soon as you brought it up, I knew exactly where I was going with this one, and it was something that blew my fucking mind in the movie. So they sneak into the country club, right? And right. uh, they're pretending to yeah. be all upper crust and everything. Yeah. So, you know, they're going, the establishment is going out of their way to show how proper they are here. Well, Robert Downey Jr., of course, sneaks a four foot baguette down the front of his pants <laughs> and gets caught with it. The waiter pulls it out of Robert Downey Jr.'s pants, then puts it back on the buffet table. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Would that, you? That's what James Spader takes. He takes yes. the tainted French baguette. <laughs> the tainted baguette. I love it. That's a phenomenal addition. It's going to be a tough act to beat, Rick, but. Uh, 
Mr. Mancrush, uh, have you got any uh, any other thing that Spader might have taken from the set of Tough Turf? I do, and this is something that I'm sure it was around in the uh, the cut that hit the floor because they talk about it quite a bit, but you never see it. And that's the wedding ring from Woolworths. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes! Because you know I he put that, that on his dick. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> And she's a size six. <laughs> <laughs> they talk about that shit like multiple times. And every time they say that they're going to Woolworths to pick up a fucking wedding ring, I just lose my mind. <laughs> you go into the five and dime to pick out your engagement ring. And then she's like, oh, yeah, you got it. You have to go to Woolworths because so and so got hers there. And you could swear it looks just like a real diamond. <laughs> Did you, did you ever have a Woolworths? I had one. It was oh, like, yeah. it's like a, it's like Walgreens kind of, but not as, not as good as Walgreens. Right. It's like a, it's like a shitty Walgreens with a little diner in it. it. It was, okay. Think of, for those of you that didn't live in the Northeast, um, think of Dollar General, way nicer, <laughs> yes. but in like the seventies or eighties. That was, that did was they even have them in California. I don't believe so. No, I think I it was, was. Yeah, I always thought it was a northeast thing. Only northeast. Yeah, only northeast. That's why I said she for those of Connecticut you that are not in the northeast, I need to look that up. But yeah, that's what I would take. I would take the uh, the wedding band oh, that's great. slash engagement ring from Woolworths. Oh, nice. Great. Well, I I mean I don't know what else there is in here um, that I would pick. Uh, probably you see I would probably have to after those two things the baguette. Hands down. That's <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, that's, that's tremendous. Um, he would probably, uh, I don't know, he would probably also have kept the bed sheets um, from the love scene, but not his love scene. The love scene oh. with her and the other guy. <laughs> no. That's the probably rape scene. The rape scene. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably rape scene what sheets. he took. He oh. prob- that's probably what he took. Uh, no. Uh, and that and uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s um, uh, his glasses. Pants. Whoa. No, oh. his, his sunglasses <laughs> that he's wearing around his neck when he's shirtless drumming so that it still oh, has, God. like, Downey Jr. sweat clinging, clinging to the glasses. He probably had it uh, put in some sort of uh, um, uh, sealed uh, container so that the sweat still lives on. Um, but I don't know. Apart from that, I think you guys definitely got it. The ring... The baguette, that's phenomenal. They're going in to the uh, James Spader Sleazatorium. <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, you have closed down a Sleazy Spader Springtime for 2008 with style, class, panache, and humor. I can't thank you enough. This was phenomenally good. Uh, let everyone know, individually and together, where they can find you and what they should be doing to support you and poop culture. Uh, Mark, do you want to do this since you're <laughs> used to doing you're used to doing the closeout? I don't want to do it at the same time as you. All right, well, you can check us out over at www.poopculture.com. Uh, we're on Facebook, where you can also join the Poopers Group, and that's at Poop Culture Podcast. We're also on Twitter, of course, at Poop Culture. Very active on there. Um, you can sc- subscribe to us all places where podcasts are available, like Castbox. Or Stitcher, or you know, wherever, iTunes. I hear that's pretty popular as well. So. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. I'll uh, I'll go with what Mark said there. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't change much. That's, that's awesome, guys. Thank you very much for doing this, and uh, we do hope that you will come back to the After Movie Diner in the future. We'll maybe do that Anthony Michael Hall, Michael Bure movie <laughs> Into the Sun. <laughs> Uh, maybe that's our uh, 80s, uh, as you guys are the 80s connoisseurs, maybe that's our next delve into the madness of the 80s. But uh, until then, thanks ever so much for being on the show. This was uh, fantastic. Thanks, man. Thank you. It was fun. I feel the thunder. I feel the pain. I know the struggles you keep, the nights in the rain. face I hear your eyes I know oh, the nights working. that you cry but still He's crazy. we survive 
members of this club. Well, how about that, Frankie? Come on. <laughs> 